I would assume that part of that applause is for HBO because they do a great job sponsoring the talks that take place in this space. I'm Annette Insdorf. I'm delighted to see so many people that I know here tonight, as well as a few that I don't know. And I'm sorry that it got very crowded and some of you are not in the most comfortable seats. The most recent book that um, I've written is called Cinematic Overtures, How to Read Opening Scenes. And it's based on the way that I've essentially been teaching for decades at Columbia and before that at Yale, convinced that it's the first few scenes, the first few moments of a motion picture that give us the thematic and stylistic handles for the rest of the movie. Um, I could talk about my approach for hours, but we only have about an hour tonight, including clips. And I decided to focus on a particular aspect that many of my students, some of whom are here tonight, and colleagues, have found particularly interesting in the book, and that is misdirection. In other words, when we watch a movie, when we go in, those first few moments, we sit down and some questions are implicit. Who is the main character? Um, what is the story? When and where does it take place? And why should we be watching it? Traditional movies begin with an establishing shot, something that indicates the time, the place, and whose story we're going to be following. Well, I'm more interested. I tend to practice more of my sympathetic scholarship on the movies that tweak our assumptions the ones that replace an establishing shot with a mobile gaze, something that keeps redefining our focus. Well, American movies like The Conversation and Rising Sun and Psycho and The Truman Show, these are examples of films that undermine our complacency as moviegoers. They keep us actively engaged in the unfolding of the tale. They make us aware not only of what is being revealed, but what is being concealed. They exploit the mysteries and the intricacies of camera narration, including these zoom shots that carry us into a mystery. A self-conscious opening is crucial to the theme of surveillance in The Conversation from 1974. How many here have seen Coppola's film? Okay, good, a majority. Well, some of you are my students, so no surprise, but um, <laughs> compared to uh, Coppola's Godfather trilogy, as, as well as Apocalypse Now, its scale is modest. It takes place entirely in San Francisco, but I think that his exploration of cinematic form is even more sophisticated here. The film editor and sound designer Walter Murch was nominated for an Academy Award for designing the sound of the conversation, whose story is grounded in the act of recording. Um, this film is very much expressive of its era. Coppola was two thirds of the way through filming when the Watergate break-in took place. Gene Hackman stars as the skilled wiretapper Harry Call in a performance of impressive restraint or implosion. The conversation foregrounds sound, and the role that it plays in breaching privacy, in inducing paranoia, and in maintaining the illusion of control. In this opening sequence that we're about to watch, the viewer has to focus very attentively because the details will be revealed in a very gradual manner. We're going to see the opening of the, conversa uh, the conversation. So what have we just seen? From that extreme high angle, the camera slowly zooms in, reframing a number of vital elements during this lunch hour in the San Francisco Square. A mime who is imitating pedestrians introduces two themes of the conversation, namely privacy invasion and distorted reproduction. The visual doubling he creates is heightened by the shadows cast on the pavement. Given the increasingly crucial role that sound will play in the conversation, well, the microphone um, is going to be the main device 
That means the mind is the only one in the square who's impervious to this kind of surveillance. Mm -hmm. The second shot presents a gun sight, followed by a subjective view of a young couple. Are we being invited to share the gaze of an assassin? It would appear that in fact that's the case, or is the camera merely aligned, as it turns out, with the shotgun microphone that permits surveillance? It's the latter that will be validated by the rest of the film because we'll see how hidden microphones are in fact tailing the couple. It seems appropriate that the same word is used for what a camera and the gun do. They shoot. Now, even if a film shot is obviously less lethal, Coppola in this film does address the guilt of those who turn people into objects that are captured electronically. The music grows increasingly louder as the sound effects also rise when the camera pans the crowd at eye, crowd at eye level. Well, it's the distorted sound of the couple's conversation that alerts us to the real focus of the film. They are the targets of oral voyeurs, and basically we're following people who are paid to eavesdrop on them. One of the questions that Coppola raises in this opening and throughout the film is what can we trust? Not the tape that Harry makes, which is distorted at the end. Um, at the beginning of the film, Frederick Forrest, the actor, says the line, he'd kill us if he got the chance. But at the end of the film, we hear it as, he'd kill us if he got the chance, which essentially changes the meaning of the conversation and the scene. Unlike traditional motion pictures, Coppola in this film offers the unsettling reply that nothing can be trusted not even the images and sounds created by gifted filmmakers. Coppola creates an active skepticism, as do, by the way, a few other key films that were made the same year, including Polanski's Chinatown, um, Bob Fosse's Lenny, uh, The Parallax View, directed by Alan Pakula, who also made All the President's Men. Well, Coppola shares with another San Francisco-based filmmaker the cinematic interrogation of what to trust as viewers. It's Philip Kaufman, the subject of my previous book. Um, he already elaborated on this theme in his version in 1978 of Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Whether he presents a gradual revelation or a twist in perspective, there is an inherently political dimension to his narrative strategy of disorientation. His movies, which include um, The Right Stuff, The Unbearable Lightness of Being, Quills, um, these movies often lead us to look more closely and critically at the images surrounding us. We see how easy it is to be duped and how vigilant a viewer or a citizen must remain. His movie Rising Sun from 1993 is a lesser known one, but I think it's a gem. It acknowledges the potential duplicity of all recorded images. If the focus of the book on which it's based, Michael Crichton's novel, a bestseller, that was about Japanese corporate takeover in the US, but Kaufman's films, film deftly juxtaposes at least four levels. It's a murder mystery, it's a satire on American business confronted by Japanese investment, a mentoring relationship between a, a feisty detective who's paired with a mysterious sage, and it's also an exploration of whether we can believe what we see. In the sleek boardroom of a Los Angeles skyscraper belonging to a Japanese firm, a young American woman is found dead after kinky sex with an unidentified man. Two detectives are brought in to investigate Cheryl's murder. The elegant Japanese-speaking Connor, played by Sean Connery. And uh, he seems to have very little in common with Webb, played by Wesley Snipes, a volatile, divorced African-American father. But together, they unravel the murder mystery, which is both obscured by technology and revealed by it. 
Connor is given a laser disc that recorded the sexual escapade and strangling in the boardroom. The killer's face is not visible until they notice a reflection that turns out to be Eddie, Cheryl's rich boyfriend. Case closed? Not quite. Jingo, a Japanese-American video expert who has a deformed hand, she shows them how the disc has been doctored. Eddie's face was inserted. Well, the opening sequence of Rising Sun brings us into this world. It's extremely unsettling. It begins with the sound of Japanese taiko drums as the camera zooms into red. And by the way, the score was composed by Toru Takemitsu, best known for the films of Kurosawa. The opening of Rising Sun. Kaufman actually said about the opening that the red is the sun, glare, intense heat, where our eyes are not supposed to look for fear of being blinded. Well, what do we see and hear? A jarring human yell accompanying images of ants roasting in the sun before being crushed by horses' hooves, a dog carrying a hand, a woman tied up on horseback. The shocking accumulation of stylized images seems to be from a Western, but the camera recedes from that screen to reveal a karaoke club. The film within the film turns out to be the background for the song <coughs> Don't Fence Me In, being sung by Eddie and four Asian American men doing backup. The film thus reminds us that there is always something we are not seeing beyond the immediate frame. This introduces the theme of untrustworthy video images. The displacement of Cole Porter's music um, being performed by a Yakuza barbershop quartet, it's a witty preparation for the juxtaposition of cultures that the film will indeed explore. And as the camera moves further back, we realize just how partial our perception has been. Because in what seemed like a nighttime city, a nighttime scene in the Asian city, Cheryl, who's fed up with Eddie singing, gets up from the bar and goes out into the brightly lit Los Angeles. Here's what Kaufman said when I asked him about that. Quote, if Crichton said he was issuing a wake-up call to America, the economic sector, the film is a wake-up call to, a, to what Americans need in film viewing habits, unquote. A tilt from her red sports car to the top of a skyscraper, well, that specifies that it is February 9th, 6.13 a.m. As in Hitchcock's cycle, the printed detail of time and place accompanies a voyeuristic self-awareness. Self if Hitchcock's film of 1960 takes us through half-closed blinds into a dark hotel room, where a partly undressed woman is in bed with a man, Kaufman shifts the voyeurism from the more erotic to the more technological. He foregrounds the surveillance aspect that we already saw in the conversation. Well, we know that Alfred Hitchcock was the master, not only of suspense, but of the self-conscious voyeuristic gaze. And the opening of Psycho remains a textbook case. Um, it's, it shows us what heightened peeping is all about. The credit sequence designed by Saul Bass provides an organic frame, introducing titles that are jagged and fragmented. Given that we later learn Norman Bates, played by Anthony Perkins, has something of a split personality, in retrospect, the graphic titles are a graphic depiction of his psychological state. The verticals become the buildings of the first shot. The horizontals become the blinds. The famous sequence you're about to see establishes the character, well, actually it establishes the camera as an active narrative presence. And it, what, what it really establishes is the audience as a bunch of peeping toms. Mm -hmm. The beginning of Psycho.
<clears throat> so those titles of the exact time and place, they suggest the authenticity of what we now call a procedural, tracking details as if facts were verifiable. The camera moves stealthily from that establishing shot of Phoenix into a closer view, and finally, of course, through those, <laughs> it penetrates the half-closed blinds into darkness, revealing appropriately enough a couple engaged in what might be illicit sexual activity. Well, like the camera, we are merely curious observers at this stage, but Hitchcock will soon lead us out of detachment into compelling identification with ambiguous characters. The misdirection of Hitchcock's opening includes the camera finding the film's star, Janet Leigh. Well, Hitchcock will wreak havoc with audience expectations by having her killed in the first third of the film. It's through the gradually increasing use of subjective camera that we are involved first with Marion, Janet Leigh, who is a thief, and then with Norman Bates, a peeping Tom. Hitchcock's meticulous camera placement and movement are expressive throughout the film. For example, there's a two-shot of Norman under a stuffed bird, suggesting a link between the two. And this is developed in a low-angle close-up of Norman's chin as he chews. He's depicted as a bird of prey, related to the slashing beaks of Hitchcock's next film, The Birds. By contrast, extreme high angle shots in the old mansion, they're not only for practical reasons so that we never get close to mother's face, but they also provide a bird's eye perspective, the illusion of a privileged perch above the horror. Um, Hitchcock presents us with hollow eyes, with stuffed birds, with Norman's tirade at the end against institutions because of the cruel eyes studying you, unquote. Well, the gaze of the film's audience is presumably more benign, the portal of a voyeurism less cruel than curious. A fascinating cinematic riff in this regard is The Truman Show from 1998, directed by Peter Weir, from an original screenplay by Andrew Nichol. This dramatic comedy is, invites speculation on how free a human being can be in a society where manipulation by an unseen force is the norm. In an ongoing TV broadcast, Truman, played by Jim Carrey, is not aware that he is always on camera. He lives in an idyllic house with a perky wife. He drives to his insurance job in picture postcard Sea Haven. He smiles broadly. Well, the multi-layered opening sequence turns out to be self-consciously fabricated. In this clip, the director Christoph is played by Ed Harris. This is a film worth rediscovering, by the way. Well, as you've seen, after Christoph speaks directly to the camera, we see Truman, as the camera zooms out, he too directly addresses a lens, but unwittingly, as this is a private moment in his bathroom mirror. An attentive viewer might notice the pixelated horizontal lines, as well as the green live sign, on the bottom right-hand corner. In retrospect, these do alert us to an external recording device. We're seeing him on a TV monitor, like the audience, within the film. The credits are for the, quote, real Truman Show, and it's appropriately ironic that the very name suggests true man. It stars Truman Burbank as himself, and it's created by Christoph. Interviews with the actors then offer the double performance. Laura Linney plays the actress Hannah, who plays the wife Meryl, calling her role a blessed life. Noah Emmerich, as the actor Lewis, who plays Truman's friend Mar Marlon, says, nothing here is fake, 
It's merely control, unquote. The inner frame begins with a title announcing day 10,909, before we follow the, the gregarious persona that Truman has projected to everyone around him. The staged reality of the Truman Show, it uses a genial man's daily experience as hugely popular entertainment for bored viewers. Well, this constitutes an uneasy hybrid. Truman's fans avidly watch the live broadcast around the clock, and we are thereby presages the surveillance aspect that's now prevalent in our lives, whether it's our streets, our buildings, our homes. And he is really masterfully portraying a brave new world where 5,000 hidden cameras record Truman's every move. Truman believes that he's the subject of his own life, but he's really the object of the director, Christoph. Once we are aware of the exploitation of Truman, do we identify with the protagonist or with the puppet master? Christoph's name, it's spelled C-H-R-I-S-T-O-F, suggests a religious dimension. But Polish director Krzysztof Kieslowski <laughs> seems more relevant. His films, notably The Decalogue, question whether the screenplay of our lives is already written. In Blind Chance, his masterful film of 1987 as well, Kishlowski dramatizes the extent to which human beings are free or subject to the whims of either destiny or maybe a capricious divinity. The music of Wojciech Kilar, who composed the score of Blind Chance, is part of the soundtrack of The Truman Show. So we know that Peter Weir must have seen those movies. Truman, as we see, grows suspicious and ultimately realizes that he exists for the eyes of others. He tries to escape the island, finally making it to the edge of the set. Our hero exits the frame, his freedom contingent on the audience both within The Truman Show and beyond it, contingent on our letting him go. Well, after the misdirection of the film's introduction, we too, while being entertained, have moved into a far more engaged questioning of images. Misdirection is a sharp tool for foreign cinema as well. Before the rain and where do we go now are among the most powerful films from war-ravaged countries. They offer a poignant vision of characters trapped in cycles of repetition, whether determined by history or personal circumstance. They manifest a fruitful tension between a story that moves forward on a horizontal axis and a vision that spirals backwards in time. As Godard famously said, a movie should have a beginning, a middle, and an end, but not necessarily in that order. The repetition of images provides not only aesthetic coherence, but um, a philosophical awareness, perhaps telling us that history is not simply progress, but rather recurrence. As still raging wars rhyme with previous violent escalations, while human needs and fears well, they change little over centuries or national borders. Before the Rain was the first entry from Macedonia for the Best Foreign Language Film Oscar, and it won the grand prize at the 1994 Venice Film Festival. Comparisons were made at the time to Pulp Fiction. Quentin Tarantino directed it at approximately the same moment, but this Balkan triptych offers, I think, um, it, it uses the fractured narrative structure in a more philosophically organic way. Writer-director Milcho Manchevsky divided his first feature into three sections, words, faces, pictures, also the elements of film language. The film takes place against, oh, and by the way, that really does suggest his sensibility, which is photographic and literary and spiritual. The film takes place against the backdrop of ethnic tensions between 
Orthodox Christian Macedonians, and Muslim Albanians. In the first section, Kirill, a young priest who's taken a vow of silence, finds a young Albanian girl hiding in his room. Zamira is being pursued by vengeful Macedonians who believe that she killed one of their shepherds. Part two jumps to contemporary London, where photo editor Anna is working with images of war victims, and we see one photo that includes the corpse of Zamira. Anna is having an affair with Alexander, a Macedonian photographer who urges her to leave London with him. Part three returns to Macedonia with Alexander. After an absence of 16 years, he learns that the Albanians are now considered enemies. Well, he still loves Hannah, the Albanian mother of Zamira. It's when he visits Hannah at the home of her father that the stories come together. Zamira flees to the monastery where we see Kirill in the same shot as the film's opening. Before the rain thus seems to close in a loop. I'm curious, how many of you have ever seen this film? Okay, just a few. That's one that I really recommend highly. I hope you'll see why from the opening. <clears throat> Even before the action begins, an epigraph is, is both printed against the black sky and spoken by the male off-screen voice. It's from the novel Death and the Dervish, and it sets the film's tone of impending violence. The opening sequence is a rich introduction to Manchevsky's internal rhymes. The hands picking tomatoes from the grounds of a monastery in the mountains they turn out to be the hands of Kiryu. Even if the priest says, time never dies, the circle is not round, the children's game introduces a sense of violent entrapment. Internal rhymes heighten the sense of cyclical bloodshed. If the priest says, it's time, at the beginning, Alexander repeats these words at the end in the last section. Imprisonment is expressed through circular patterns, including shots of the full moon above the monastery. The internal rhymes inform the film's very structure, as the first section turns out to be a continuation of the third. In other words, part two precedes part three, which precedes part one. The enclosed universe presents a loop with minor variations corresponding to a line spoken by Alexander's cousin when they pursue Zamira, quote, it's time to collect five centuries of blood, unquote. As the director acknowledged in interviews, Balkan culture manifests the historical grip of repetition more than the Western idea of progress. Before the Rain offers a tragic vision of characters more likely to be killed by one of their own family members than by the enemy. Even children seem locked into this pattern because what I didn't show you is what follows the end of the clip. Um, the circle that the children have made around the Ninja Turtles, there are twigs there. Well, they light those twigs on fire. And it raises the question of whether innocence is even possible in this world. The graffiti on a London wall in part two reads, time never dies, the circle is not round. The same words spoken by the priest in the opening. But his words at the very end of the film are, time does not wait, and the circle is not round. They diverge just enough to suggest the possibility of an opening, of a way out of the vicious cycle. As I think you just heard, the music is such an integral component of the film's tone, which is both archaic and modern. The syncopated, percussive minor score, minor key score, is by Anastasia, three Macedonian archivists. And it seems to either foreshadow fatal actions in all three sections, or to mourn them. 
Well, music is central to our last clip of the evening. It's from Nadine Labaki's Arabic language ensemble piece, Where Do We Go Now? I'm guessing that almost nobody in this room has seen it. Anybody? Oh, well, of course. Well. But I'm, I'm therefore very happy to be including it alongside such better known films as Psycho. This movie offers a fresh female perspective on sectarian violence in the Middle East. This fable is not only feminist and political, but humanist. It proved quite popular after the world premiere at the Cannes Film Festival. It won the audience, People's Choice Audience Award at the 2011 Toronto Film Festival, and it was Lebanon's entry for the Best Foreign Language Film Oscar. From the very opening of an isolated mountain village, women are the focus. Christian and Muslim females dressed in black, you'll see how they approach the camera in unified movements, choreographed to mournfully vibrant music. And the score is by Khaled Muzanar, who is the husband of director Labaki. Um, I'll say more after you watch the clip. We begin with that female voiceover. It accompanies the stylized and ritualistic image. When they reach the cemetery, the women tend to the graves of their husbands and children. The opening sequence establishes the coexistence not only of numerous characters, but of narrative tones. Just as a dance formation enlivens a funeral procession, Musical numbers throughout the film will distance us, suggesting a means of escape from the violent backdrop. Labaki plays uh, Amal, one of the women that we see at the beginning. She's a young Christian widow whose cafe is the hub of the town's activity. She is attracted to a Muslim worker painting her cafe, and in a musical number that projects her daydream, they sing their emotions. Another colorful scene shows the women baking hash cookies together in a musical number, their agenda being very simply to get their man, men happily inebriated so they won't notice the women stealing their hidden guns and re-hiding them. Well, this culminates in quite a transformation in the name of peace. The Christian women don Muslim attire, and vice versa, confusing the men with prayers that suggest they adopted the opposing religion. The end of Where Do We Go Now evokes the film's beginning, but this time, men and women are unified in the walk to the cemetery carrying a corpse. The film's title, which appears right after the opening credits, returns verbally when the pallbearer asks, where do we go now? They don't know whether to bury the young man in the Christian or Muslim section of the cemetery. Labaki leaves the question up in the air, closing with a simple dedication to our mothers. This ties back to the opening of women approaching the cemetery. Despite radical tonal shifts between scenes of bloodshed and upbeat musical performances, these very juxtapositions form part of the film's vision. Where Do We Go Now invites us to take a step back and to appreciate the shared flawed humanity that can take comic as well as tragic shape. Labaki's healing vision is rooted in female empowerment. It is an audaciously refreshing anti antidote to the, the war films that are frankly anchored in male violence, just to put it as simply as I can. Like Before the Rain, it does not focus on a single protagonist. Rather, it uses the form of the ensemble piece. It's the collective protagonist that embodies and represents communal coexistence. There is a wonderful African proverb that is quoted um, at the end of a film 
that I wish had gotten more attention from 2013 called The Good Lie. It was a splendid ensemble piece. The line is, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together, unquote. The opening sequences of the films that we've touched upon tonight, they certainly draw us in, they entertain us, but their misdirection does more. It invites a vigorous skepticism and lucidity. We need those now, I think, more than ever. And I'm going to stop here because I'm supposed to be signing books right now, but thank you all for coming.